A couple of years ago, the mathematician Hannah Fry made a TV documentary about Ada Lovelace, the 19th century computer theory pioneer. It was about an episode in the history of ideas, which would have been absolutely pivotal if anybody had noticed it at the time. Or in other words, if Lovelace hadn't died young. Because, well, from the evidence in that documentary, I suspect that the first person to get the universality of computation was actually Lovelace and not her colleague, Charles Babbage, the designer of the universal computer that she was theorizing about, the, uh, Babbage's analytical engine. Never built, but like many of these computers, the significance was in the design and the theory rather than actual building. The thing is, the analytical engine would have had two kinds of universality, and Babbage was obsessed with one of them. He had perhaps been the first human being to understand what, what one could call arithmetical universality. In his previous design, the difference engine, could compute polynomials in one fixed point variable, so, you know, very limited kind of universality is universal for those. But Babbage realized that if he added just a few more features, uh, conceptually very simple, the machine would make the jump to universality, becoming the analytical engine, universal for any arithmetic function of any number of variables of any finite precision, basically what we would today call computable functions. So this was arithmetical universality. What Lovelace understood, I think, was the significance of the analytical engine's ability to compute not just any arithmetic, but anything in the world, in the physical world. She envisaged all sorts of applications like computer music and art and chess and, and so on. But this wasn't just a matter of usefulness. The abilities of the analytical engine as a physical object depend on a momentous property of the laws of physics themselves, all of them. Namely, while the analytical engine could instantiate a tiny fraction of all an infinitesimal fraction of all mathematical objects and relationships, it could also apparently, apparently, <laughs> instantiate or simulate or emulate all possible motions of all possible physical objects and their laws, not just a tiny subset. This physical universality is an intrinsic property of the laws of physics. It doesn't follow from Babbage's uh, arithmetical universality. It has nothing to do with mathematics. In fact, neither of the universalities follows from the other. Yet, it seemed that both of them were exhibited by the same machine. Why? Well, whatever the reason, it's in the laws of physics. It would make no sense to try to prove this other than from the laws of physics. This unity of the two universalities was also conjectured later explicitly by Alan Turing in the 20th century. It's just Turing's conjecture, sometimes called the church Turing thesis. It has various names. But the usual way that this conjecture is described is not that it's the unity of those two universalities. Why not? Well, Turing's great paper presenting his conjecture had an application, as he put it, to a fundamental puzzle posed by the mathematician David Hilbert. Basically, what is the relationship between a true mathematical statement and a provable one? 
Hobart had hoped that one could define a system of proof such that a mathematical statement was true if and only if it could be proved under that system. In the 1930s, mathematicians converge from several directions on the realization that that is impossible. Notably, Kurt Gödel proved that there can be no method of proof that identifies all true mathematical propositions. Now, Turing's approach <clears throat> did exactly the same in that respect, but it had wider implications, as we now know, because of these physical objects, computers. The reason Turing's approach had this additional reach was that Gödel's model of proof was a model inside the arithmetic of the integers, so nothing to do with computation. He simply defined proofs as finite sequences of symbols drawn from a finite set and all that stuff. But there was no Gödel's conjecture. It was Turing who realized that that notion of what proving something means isn't self-evident. So he acknowledged it as a substantive conjecture, the Turing conjecture. The model of proof that he used was computation. And the model of computation that he used was physical. Strips of paper divided into squares with symbols and a finite set of discrete operations on them, the universal Turing machine. And when he conjectured that this machine was universal for proofs, the phrase he used was that it could compute anything which would naturally be regarded as computable. Naturally. At the time, the word computer meant a human being. It wasn't one of these things. It, a, a person whose job was to manipulate symbols on sheets of paper. And the manipulators obeying the rules, human beings are physical systems. So by anything that would naturally be regarded as computable, he meant computable in nature by physical objects. And by provable, he meant provable by physical objects. Now that conjecture, unlike Gödel's proofs, might have been false but it turned out to be true in nature, or rather, very nearly true. As Richard Feynman remarked, they thought they understood paper, but they didn't. And when, when, I, when I proved Turing's conjecture from quantum theory in 1985, it was with the slight correction that the universal machine is not Turing's paper machine, nor Babbage's brass gear machine, but the universal quantum computer. But I soon found out that not everyone saw it that way. The ref I also had a referee problem. The, the referee of the paper in which I, I, I presented that proof insisted that Turing's phrase would naturally be regarded as computable referred to mathematical naturalness. Mathematical intuition, not nature. And so what I had proved wasn't Turing's conjecture, it was about physics. So I asked some mathematicians what math mathematical intuition is. Turned out it was as much of a mystery to them as to me. So some of them said it was meta-mathematical intuition. Fair enough but they couldn't tell me what that was either. Some kind of mathematical mysticism, I think. But one thing they were all adamant about, nevertheless, was that Turing's conjecture was about whether his mathematical model of proof matched not the physical world, but something else, like mathematical intuition or something. Now, Turing's basic insight was that proof is computation, and computation is physical, and hence proof is physical. That it isn't physical seemed to me a philosophical absurdity, 
but it was an absurdity that all the mathematicians I asked insisted on. And most, not all, most non-mathematicians who thought about computation didn't. So I called it the mathematician's misconception. The denial that proof is physical is one way of putting it. By the way, uh, Rolf Landauer, uh, Charles Bennett's old boss, had been campaigning for years with the slogan, computation is physical and proof also. Just to be clear, mathematical facts, like Fermat's last theorem, aren't physical. That there is a difference between truth and provability was the main point of all those 1930s discoveries. Still, in my paper, I had to defer to prevailing usage. So I changed it to define Turing's conjecture as that vague meta-mathematical idea. And the referee at least agreed to let me call my result a proof of the Turing principle to distinguish it from the conjecture. The principle that there can be a physical object whose motions contain uh, those of all other objects. Nevertheless, now people sometimes call that the church turing deutsch principle. And, and that's, how, that's how the mathematician's conception ended up giving me credit for something Alan Turing did, and arguably Ada Lovelace did. A few years later, I gave a talk in Oxford arguing that it makes no sense to regard Turing's conjecture in any form as something one might hope to prove one day from, from logic, like Fermat's last theorem, but that it could be proved to be a property of quantum mechanics. Sitting in the front row was Robin Gandhi, who'd worked with Turing, and he got a bit agitated, and at the end he, he stood up and declared with, with good humor, but very emphatically, I've never heard such a load of rubbish in my life. Uh, I, I tried to explain further, but he, he seemed implacable. He'd also given a talk at the same event, and at the dinner afterwards, he came over to where I was sitting, and he said, you know, I think there might have been a grain of truth in there somewhere. Let, let's talk about it later. And we did discuss it later. But unfortunately, we did not reach a resolution. He was a mathematician. He had the misconception. Unfortunately, in, in the bigger picture, the mathematician's misconception has done more than just cause amusing anecdotes. It expresses the idea, acknowledged or not, that somewhere out there in, in the world of mathematical ab abstractions or in some supernatural world of mathematical intuition, there is the authentic, official, though ineffable, now we know that Hilbert was wrong, ineffable definition of proof. And if some physical process that doesn't conform to that definition turns out to allow us to know some new necessary truth, that process wouldn't constitute a proof of that truth. There's the misconception. It so happens that a quantum computer's repertoire of integer functions is the same as the Turing machines. They differ only in speed. So some people view this as vindicating the mathematician's misconception. But no, first of all, we only know that they only differ in speed from physics, from quantum theory. And second, quantum theory won't be the final theory of physics. And even if it is, you can't prove that either from mathematical intuition. In reality, we only have physical intuition, never provable, always incomplete, always full of errors. The misconception also affects thinking about information, for example, a quantum cryptographic device may perform a classical information processing task that is provably impossible classically. 
So the misconception makes people say, well, quantum cryptography isn't an information processing task. It's just an engineering task, like building a washing machine. Why? Because Turing machines couldn't perform it. Again, they think that there's a mathematical definition of information out there somewhere, independent of physics. Um, the same holds for probability, by the way. Similarly, again, the answer to Eugene Wigner's famous question about why mathematics is unreasonably effective, as he put it, in science, is not that the, math that the physical world is actually being computed on a vast computer belonging to God or to supernormal aliens, snailians, because there's no reason other than the misconception why the Snailian's computer should itself generate that particular tiny piece of mathematics that we call computable. Purely mathematical intuition will never reveal anything about proof or computation or probability or information. If you want to understand any of those things fundamentally, you must start with laws of physics and in particular with what is currently the most fundamental theory in physics, quantum theory. It won't always be the most fundamental, but its replacement will not come from mathematics or logic or the supernatural.